my studio. I'm Susan Smith. I am a long arm quilter and this morning I'm going to be freehand quilting a smallish project for you from beginning to end. So I know that when I was beginning quilting, well let's back up a little. When you're learning something new as far back as when you're learning to walk and talk, right? One of the ways you learn is by observing how other people do it and as you grow up it might be in school or it might be at a new job and you learn just by observing, right? No one has to necessarily teach you every step. You just kind of catch it. Well, with long arm quilting, that doesn't work as well because you don't usually long arm alongside somebody else, right? It's kind of a solitary thing. So I thought that doing some episodes like this would be helpful to quilters who don't get to see how someone does their work. A lot of the YouTube shows in that, you know, they've been edited to show the important parts or to teach a particular thing, but you seldom get to just watch somebody quilt from start to finish. So that's what this is all about. So without further ado, we shall begin. So while I'm loading, say hi in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, if you feel like it, let us know where you are in your quilting journey. You know, you are a long armor and you have one. What is it? Um, you dabble in quilting for yourself, maybe you're starting to quilt as a business, whatever your particular journey may be. Love to hear about it. Hi from Texas. Hi from Texas, nice. And by the way, my husband Dave is behind the workings of all this, producing this, so he's relaying comments to me and throwing them up on the screen. There he is. So he's the, the other half of this show. And I'm sorry you can't see everything in camera. There's just no way. That's the other challenge with long arming, right? There's just no way to get a 12 foot machine in from every angle. So I'm loading using red snappers. Um, they're my preferred method for speed, but they are not essential. I, I loaded for years using pins too. But as you'll see with my loading, I do not center, I do not find the center of my quilt back or top or of my leaders for that matter. So I'm just loading my back on where I'd like it to be approximately in the middle of my long arm and you'll see how that works in just a minute. Hang on a sec, I'm just going to adjust my mic here a little bit. Apparently we're getting heavy breathing. Is that better? Okay, we have watchers from Oregon and from Arizona. I bet you guys have more warm weather than I have today. We've had some fresh snow this week. We're going to mute the mic for just a second and try and give it a fix here. We back on. Okay, is that better? Hopefully the mic is not bouncing around on my cheek anymore. West Virginia, has snow. West Virginia is on, has snow, wow. So this is not particularly an instructional video, but I will kind of chatter as I go. So get a sense of what I'm doing. So I've just smoothed, this is the backing of my quilt and I've just pushed it over the rails to the back of my machine. And what this is going to enable me to do is just roll it on and it will keep this nice and straight. I've adjusted it so that I don't have any wrinkles pulling in one direction or another, right? It goes nice and straight over the back of my machine. And then I can just roll it on. And as you can imagine, if you're doing a lot of quilts, it is an enormous time saver to load this way, as opposed to centering everything. 
and two, because I do quilt a lot for clients, and I would say more than half of the quilts come to me without a well squared up back. And so that doesn't really matter. I put one straight side on the front rail. Pardon me if I puff a little. This is a bit of effort involved in this. So I put one straight side on that front rail and then just flip the rest of it over the back rail. And whatever hangs off at the end or whatever goes a little bit crooked on the sides doesn't matter to me as long as it's laying flat across the front and the back rails. And then I get in my steps trotting around my quilting machine. And there we go. The backing is loaded. You can see it's nice and snug and straight. Lovely. California. Someone here from California saying hi. Robin, let me read that one. Hi from Fortuna, California. Have owned a long arm for almost two years, rented before that. Now I really have time to perfect my long arm skills. And it went away, Dave. There we go. I do freehand and ruler work, no computer. Love to watch you quilt. Thanks, Robin. So I have always done no computer work. It is only in recent weeks that I upgraded my machine. It's still a used one, but a level up from where I was. So I now do have a computer, so the odd time. I will run one that way, but my favorite for sure is still quilting freehand. That is what I do most of the time. Dave, would you mind handing me a pair of scissors? So I buy, um, yeah, I buy my batting really wide so that I can often get two quilts side by side if they're small lap quilts. But I do find that I can't have excess hanging off the edges. It gets caught, not surprisingly, in the wheels. So I'm just trimming off that excess there on that end. And by the way, feel free to type in questions at any time. We'll circle around to them from time to time. Um, it's helpful to us if you put a Q in front or the word question in caps, then it's quickly visible, assuming there's enough of you that the, that the chat is really running. Okay, go ahead, Dave, with the question. Yeah. Pam Thompson, how do you deal with seams on the backing? Um, I pretty much treat it like a piece of fabric. In this case, you were seeing as I was loading it, this maker has pieced in a number of excess little bits on both ends. So I just loaded it as though it was one piece of fabric. If there's only one or two seams, my preference is to have them running parallel to the rails. When you have seams running this way, they can pull a little tighter. It, it is very doable. You just have to pay a little attention to that, to keeping that from rolling up tight, if that makes sense. And a question about the red snappers. Sorry, I have to take my glasses off to read the screen. Jerry, I have an issue with the snappers taking up too much room on my back rail as I put more of the quilt around it. They do take up a little bit of room. It's true. I, I find it worthwhile for the time savings. I think the most inconvenient thing for me is the fact that they are chubby. And when they're right underneath, it can constrict um, against the throat of my machine. So I'm often having to raise or lower my rail to account for that, but again, I have concluded it's worth it. As you saw, it just takes me a jiffy to load a quilt compared to putting in, you know, 40 pins. So this particular maker, bless her heart, marked center on all four sides of the front and all four sides of the back, and I don't honestly need it. I did have a look at my quilt on the floor before I started. Because she has one chunk of fabric in the back, and pieces all around it, I tried to figure out how to center my quilt top from top to bottom, right? I can't see them once it's loaded, so I looked beforehand so that I could get that as centered as possible. She knows that that's um, not an exact science on the long arm, so I will just do the best that I can with that. And obviously, it's easy to, to center it from left to right. Another question, Ellen Pukolo. Oh, hi, Ellen. Greetings from Manitoba. Frozen Manitoba, no long arm, but can freehand on my domestic. Um, Ellen, I don't know if I've met you in person. I know your daughter, but I follow you on, you know, Facebook and read your posts. You are so, so creative. It's a pleasure to hear your comments too on quilting. 
So I told you guys this was truly live and unscripted, like I didn't even load my thread in advance. So you get to see everything, or at least hear it, because of course you can't see me run to my thread rack, but here I go. So I'm just loading up my bobbin winder with the right color thread. I could have had that done in advance. Um, I was doing these a week or two ago, and people were asking if I purchase preloaded bobbins or load my own. And I do choose to load my own. I have a freestanding bobbin winder. So once I get it going, every time I take one bobbin off when I'm working on a quilt, I just go ahead and load the next one. So it just takes four or five seconds to get that bobbin changed over and a fresh one loading. Dave's just going to adjust the camera, so if you see it a little movement, that will pass. Don't get seasick. You guys can see me here. I'm going to show you one of my favorite low-cost tools. Where am I in the camera? There we are. This little, ah, can't reach it. There we are. This little thread net that I'm holding. You know how you have a million lonely socks in the laundry? I just cut a chunk out of the foot of it, and that is my thread net for my big spools. I'm the queen of low-cost tools, let me tell you. I'm always looking for a way to solve my problems with something I already own. Okay, Dave's telling me we have a question. Kay, question, do you have a TOA to check your bobbins? I do, Kay. And I use it probably 50% of the time, to be perfectly honest with you. I also um, kind of, once my bobbins are in the casing, I dangle them on my hand. And I've done so many bobbins, I have a pretty good sense for whether something is amiss or not. Yes, we did talk about the red snappers. I just inadvertently unplugged one of Dave's cameras. This is also the tricky bit about trying to um, video an enormous machine, right? We're always moving about and we've got these connectors and wires and cables and it's a challenge. So I'm just doing a simple base today around the perimeter of the quilt. I was watching someone actually online yesterday who did not do that. I, I always have. I guess the first person who was giving me tips did it and I see every reason to do it and no reason not to. It does take a couple of minutes, but I think it more than makes up for those minutes in uh, savings of accuracy and of having to undo and of getting ugly surprises when your quilt has gone all crooked like a big frown when you get to the bottom. So to me it's totally worth it. So I'm basically just basting three sides of the quilt at this point and then every time I advance I'll do the two sides again. And that's it. Jerry is asking what a channel lock is. Um, they work a little differently on different machines, but in my case, it is a magnet that clamps onto, you can't see my hand, but onto the rails of my machine. So there is both a vertical and a horizontal, and it is really simple. It is just a magnet that holds it still. So I did use that across the top edge of the quilt so I get a nice straight edge across the top. Sometimes I use it on the sides, sometimes not depending on how straight I judge the quilt is. Uh, 
Um, I can take a couple questions now. Carrie, what thread do you use or prefer? I use Isacord, which is 100% poly. It was actually developed as an embroidery thread, so it is specifically geared for high-speed machines. So it lends itself to long-arm quilting, because we're also stitching at high speed. Pam, question. I have so much problems with my backing not rolling up evenly because of the seam down the middle because I have to place it that way because the top's directional, the sides sag. Well, one thing that I sometimes do is roll it a little ways and you can kind of see me in the camera. I have my hand over the seam and I'm literally putting a bit of pressure on that seam as it rolls to prevent it from rolling more quickly. Does that make sense? So wherever the seams are, but it's often in the middle, I just literally have a hand on that seam and force that to stretch out a little bit as I'm rolling. I know what you mean. That is, that is a thing. And one more is, I had the same question. What is TOA? What is TOA? A TOA is a, it's a brand name, and it's just a little tiny gauge that you can pop a bobbin into, and then you, you spool the thread and pull it against a spring, and it gives you a, a numbered measurement of the tension that's on that thread. They're not inexpensive, but they're pretty useful for determining, like for example, if your bobbin did not wind smoothly, if that gauge bobs up and down, you know your bobbin is not releasing thread smoothly. Better to know that before you load it up and start quilting, believe me. So I'm just putting tension now on my sides and I don't put a lot of tension on, just a little. And we're ready to quilt. So today I'm going to quilt a design that's going to form an orange peel effect. And basically it's a half circle in every one of these squares. And they're only three inch squares. Actually, they might only be two and a half finished. Let's have a peek here. Yeah, they're only two and a half finished. So I'm going to try and eyeball it. If it doesn't work, you'll be seeing me draw a dot in the middle of all these squares. So hopefully the eyeball method will work. And you won't see the neat effect until I've done quite a few. Have faith in me. A little too big. Pause just a second, I've lost one thread guide. There we go. Mm. Now I've got it twisted. It's kind of interesting to me because I do spend quite a bit of time quilting. Any one of you that does that or sews at your machine a lot we'll find the same thing to be true. I'm having a heck of a time keeping it in those thread guides. Um, you get so used to exactly how much the thread bobbles about when it's feeding through and what that should look like. As soon as it's not quite right, you recognize that. And that's what I was seeing there. Now you're starting to see the orange peel look. And I'll get a little more accurate as I go. It's always this way when you first start out a quilt. Ideally, you'd have a practice row that you could throw away, but it doesn't work that way. So there is a little story behind this quilt. 
It belongs to a client named Laura. And Laura does a lot of piecing of quilts for various um, charitable purposes. Alzheimer um, clinics or hospices or things like that. And she's often using up her scraps. So I get quite a few of these. I don't know what the word is for them, but just quilts that are made of squares. And the sizes vary a little bit. And so we've tried different things. I've done quite a lot of cross hatching on them. So just using a ruler and going through the lines, which is fairly straightforward because obviously all my, I don't have to do any marking. All my points are in the seam lines. But this time we thought we'd try something a little bit different. What do you guys think? Orange peel for the win or should I have stuck with crosshatch? And by the way, it's too late now. You're free to have an opinion, but it's staying crosshatch. <laughs> Or sorry, staying orange peel. Perhaps I shouldn't try talking while I quilt. I'm just going to get a little fix here. I went out of camera for a minute, and I'll show you guys what I'm doing. Um, this happens frequently that the whatever my holders or clamps are on the edge. Uh, see my yardstick in my hand? I'm just going to put it under the straps of my clamps and across both my rails, there we go. Can you see where I am here? I'm just going across the front rail and the back rail and just holding this edge up a little bit. Otherwise, my the arm of my machine is going to bump on those clamps and my curves will no longer be curves. The voting is orange peel, orange peel. Oh, good. So glad you guys agree with my choice of quilting. Apparently, the voting is unanimously orange peel so far. So I think that this design could be quilted in a continuous curve, which means you don't necessarily go from point to point. You kind of weave through the points. I just choose to do it one arc at a time because already I have enough trouble keeping track of where I'm going next. So I don't want to exacerbate that problem by complicating my quilting path. So I'm keeping it ultra simple, point to point to point. I have to stop and think a minute. Now, where am I going next? If making round circles is something you have trouble with, this is the cure, let me tell you. You'll see when the quilt is finished, you know, the little imperfections in my arcs won't show. It'll be all about texture, but this is giving me an enormous amount of practice in control and making smooth round curves. And to me, that is one of the fringe benefits of free motion quilting and edge to edge quilting is I also enjoy doing custom work and doing detailed things and even quilting for ribbons. I don't know if you can see my ribbons behind me. I do go after some ribbons and that takes control, but I don't have time to practice just for the sake of practicing, right? But when I'm doing this edge to edge quilting, by focusing on elements of practice, within whatever design I'm quilting, I can be elevating my skill quite a bit while accomplishing the quilt. And I can see already, I'm just in the second row and already I'm having an easier time visualizing that center point of each of these little squares.
So I'm curious if some of you on here are pantograph users, or honestly, even computerized quilters, digital patterns. How do you think freehand edge to edge like this stands up for time of execution against either of those methods? Um, I have not been a pantograph user. I've actually never done a whole quilt with a pantograph. But I have set them up from time to time. And I find that fairly time consuming. I'm sure you would get better at it too, but I find it fairly time consuming to line up my beginning and end points um, for every repeat, getting them to line up well. And I wanna see if you bear out my theory that this is, at the very least, it does not take more time. And at best, it maybe is a real time saver. Time for a sip of coffee. Rotate the shoulders a little bit. Yes, and I'll take some questions gladly. Uh, what is your go to stitch per inch? Stitches per inch. I have it set on 12 right now. I usually run 12 or 13, typically. Uh, I have to find them all. Dave's just hunting for your questions. Do I ever hypnotize myself? Oh gosh, yes. When you get doing things like ribbon candy, for example, all of a sudden you can get a short in your brain and you're just like, mm, I don't know where to go next. And you just have to stop and walk away for a little bit. Yeah, that's looking nice though. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. There was one more, but I can't find it. Okay, Dave's hunting for the other question. If, yeah, if someone else asked one and we haven't answered it, just type in your name and we'll know who to look for. That might help him. See it asking, I'm sorry? Allison is asking, where is B? Oh, <laughs> for those of you who, who might not know, B is my black cat. Uh, let's see. He's, he is actually not in the room. He is usually, let me get closer to the camera again. He is usually underfoot. Like w even when I film these, he's often right at the end of my long arm on the floor for the whole hour or two or three or whatever it may turn out to be. Yeah, this is a wee bit like watching paint dry. So, you know, feel free to take a break and get yourself a cup of something yummy. Or, you know, be sewing something productive while I'm doing this. Sadly, there's not a way for you to show me what you've done, but you can tell me.
when I'm quilting a design like this, I always think back to one of my older brothers teaching me to drive and telling me, don't look at the road right in front of the nose of your vehicle. Look way out in front where you want to go. If you look too close to where you're actually driving, you overcorrect and it gets jerky. But if you want to make smooth adjustments, look way out in front. Well, I find that principle applies for quilting too. So I am doing this design. I think I can safely say I am never actually looking at my needle. My eye is always jumping ahead to the next point. So right here, I'm already looking at that center point. And now my eye has already jumped to the lower seam intersection. And my needle follows where my eye goes, if that makes sense. I do apologize if you get heavy breathing into the mic. There is a certain amount of focus involved in this and I can't always think about not heavy breathing or, you know, holding my mouth straight or anything like that. You saw that little lurch there. I just bumped into my um, stretcher at the side. I'm just going to shift it a little bit because I don't have another yardstick to hold this end up. It's not critical enough that I'm going to undo it. kind of lost my way there, but again, I feel like in the scheme of things, that will not be terribly visible. And sometimes I do come back later and fix things like that if when I glance at the quilt as a whole, I feel like it's eye-catching. I'll come back and redo it.
What's happening? This light? Is that better? Is that better? That looks very, very dark on the camera. Okay, we're just going to adjust the light for a minute, ladies. There we go. Is that better? Okay. No, I'm fine without it. We'll do one more roll, one more row, sorry, and then we'll roll the quilt. It's interesting how different fabrics read the light differently. So even, you know, white, you'd think is always white. But in fact, there's all kinds of shades of white and even just the weave of the fabric makes a difference in how kind of reflective and shiny it is on camera. You guys yawning yet? This is certainly not the most exhilarating of patterns, but it sure does produce a fun result. I'm just going to take my clamp off to make sure I don't bump into it. Okay, I'll get back to the question in a moment. I'm just going to work my way now up that left side. You may or may not have noticed that I was not quilting those peels as I went downwards. And I'm right back where I started. A few lock stitches. And we're ready to advance. Okay, questions? Rose. What size are the blocks? They are finished two and a half, so they must have been three inch cut squares, I would say. Um, More questions? You answered this one, but I'm going to check it out there anyways. Uh, it looks, no, I don't think so. It looks like on the starting end, the orange peel didn't get completed. Do you, oh, I see what you mean, Dave. Do you finish that at the end of the roll? Yes, I do. Yep, so now that it's that pass is fully completed, so I only have to break thread then once in each pass. Paula, have never seen the red snappers loaded. How do you attach to the rails and will they work on any machine? So within, it's difficult for you to see from there, but where, hmm, I might have to show you at the end, Paula. Basically on my canvas leader, there's a hem in that and the red snappers come with a little red tube that you just slide in there 
and then the snap portion, this one, is U-shaped and snaps right over it. So they're, ba they're installed in my leaders. You can take them out. They just slide in and out. And that's all it is. Janet, where do you find the clamps you are using on the side? They are red snappers also, but I'll just tell you something as a little insider thing. This is the one that came with my red snapper system a couple years ago, and I love it. I recently, I broke one just from sheer use. So this is the replacement they gave me, and I confess I'm still getting used to it. It has a very slim um, channel that you have to fit the side fabric into, and seldom is the side fabric tight and perfectly straight. So I'm struggling with getting used to using that yet, which is why I've just got two clamps stuck on the other end for this morning because it's way faster. But I will persevere. I'll learn that. And Lisa says, what would be the max size square you would do this on? Um... Oh, I would do it on bigger squares. I would do it on a four inch square, but I'd probably mark the center dots. I think two and a half for me is about as big as I can eyeball that center point reasonably accurately. I think even three would be a stretch, but that's just me. You might be better at it than I. Um, for those of you who are in my master class, one of the pictures I showed of this design, the first quilt I did it on, every second square had a little kind of a bow tie in it. So it had a seam in it. So 50% of the quilt was marked, right? They were four inch squares, but a bunch of it had seams at that corner. That's what first gave me the idea of doing the orange peel. And then I just marked the um, alternate squares. But on this one being smaller, I'm just winging it. I'm a bit of a wing nut. Yep. You guys probably know that by now. Dave's telling me I walk so fast he has wind noise in the mic. That's funny. So this is where when my red snappers are exactly downwards on my rail, as they are at this moment, I just have to lift that rail a little bit so that my quilt is not pinching against my long arm, and it's good. You guys can't see the edge of the quilt, but I can, and so I'm not, I'm not going to quilt at arm's length here. I have a 26 inch throat, but it's difficult for me to quilt way out there. So I'm, this is the end of my quilted portion. And I can see that I'll be able to do it in one more pass after this. So there's no point in making myself go crazy trying to quilt at arm's length. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just using my, the seam that is conveniently on my quilt, you know, to, to gauge that this is running nice and straight along my rail. In case you don't have these handy tools, they're magnetic bars, Harbor Freight or any other um, hardware store will carry them. Princess Auto, if you're in Canada, good place to get inexpensive tools. They're like, in the US, they're, I mean, I get them on sale for sometimes $2.99. And I have enough of them that I can fill my whole rail if I need to. Um, just a convenient way to hold my floating top. Another quote for, for, for the clamps. orange, oh, for the clamps? For the older, yeah. yeah the you know, you probably get used to them, so I'm going to persevere. I'm sure I'll adjust, and in any event, I don't think they make the old style anymore, so I don't really have a choice. But I do definitely like the fact that they're so long and so they pull a whole they pull the whole end of your quilt nice and taut as opposed to single clamps or even four inch wide clamps that tend to you know make a scallop on the edge of your quilt funny clamping story when i bought my first machine it was used and so the lady who had it she wasn't a terribly experienced quilter but of course i was an absolute novice so she's giving me tips and, and things like that and so she warned me, now don't clamp, don't stretch it too tight. So she showed me on her wall, she had a quilt that she had done that she literally tore the fabric. And I don't mean a seam. She clamped so tight that she tore the fabric. Yeah, you don't need to be anywhere near that tight. It's just a wee bit of tension to keep things straight. It's all you're after.
Okay, we're all set. Install our trusty yardstick again. Take a sip of coffee again. Try not to slurp too loudly in your ear. Oh, I did that one a little small, didn't I? Get my head in the game here. So I'm going to pause here for a second. I'm hearing my needle popping as it's going through the fabric. Could just be the weave of the fabric, but I know that I haven't changed it in a quilt or two. So I'm going to take a minute and put a fresh needle in. Okay, go ahead. Janet, the pincher clamps that looks like there's elastic attached on the side, did you make those? No, Janet, I got them with the red snapper system. Um, so Quilts on the Corner, I think is the name of a website and a store. And I think they're the inventors of the red snappers. And that's where I got my replacement um, clamp as well. I have not found them elsewhere. I have had one other brand and I couldn't offhand tell you the name of it that had the same long type of clamp 
I found it to be far too lightweight. It didn't hold up like I think six months and I had trashed those. So, you know, I do a lot of quilts, but still that that wasn't good enough for me. They're not inexpensive. So um, I think Red Snapper is a reliable brand. That's a longer answer probably than you wanted, but. Go for it. I'm just going to finish tightening my needle. Okay, yeah, pop it up again. Arlene, I also used the red snapper side clamps for 18 months or so. One broke, so I purchased a replacement. It only lasted maybe through three quilts and stopped clamping firmly. Had it replaced under warranty, its replacement wasn't any better. I'd gotten used to how well they held my backing that I took the financial jump and purchased a beautiful set of wooden side clamps. Yes. I I would be really curious to follow how that holds up for you, Arlene. I have seen, I think, the same guy, too, and I've heard quilters talk about them. I have not jumped for that because I have been happy with my red snappers so far. So, except for the new one that is difficult to use, but it holds well. So we'll see. If this one does not satisfy over time, I'll probably go with that method, too. It really makes a world of difference to have the depth of clamp and pulling nice and evenly across your whole quilt surface. So yeah, keep me posted, Arlene, how that works for you too. You know what, while I'm stopped, let's just check the bobbin thread. Yep. Let's not play bobbin chicken. There's only a couple of yards left on here, so we'll change that out too. So you guys can't see me, but this is about how long it takes me to set a new bobbin winding. Just like that, I'm ready to go again. To me, it's worth winding my own. It doesn't take very long. It's economical and it allows me to use the same thread top and bottom, which I generally like to do. Oh dear. Susan has not done something correctly. Hang on. We're gonna assume that's the needle. I do not know what that click is. That is a noise I've never heard before. Well, you guys, I did say this was live and unscripted, didn't I? This is exactly how it goes sometimes. And then I just redo things till I figure out where I went wrong. So I've rethreaded my bobbin now, time or two. I'm going to pull the needle out and put it back in. I do not think that needle is right still. Hmm. It's a poser. Well, it wasn't backwards, but I do think it was crooked. And I'll be quite honest, my eyesight is fairly pathetic. So I have this trusty little magnet that I use, but you can put it in 90 degrees wrong and the magnet will show still show straight. It'll pull the side to the front, if that makes sense. So I do think that is possibly where I went wrong. That sounds better. Sympathy, sympathy. I'm, I'm really grateful. You guys have all been there. I know you have. You get a morning or a day where things just you can't get them right. Are there more questions, Dave, or no? Oh, okay. Just dive in. I'm just going to buzz along the side here a minute to make sure we're stitching good. Seems like it. Okay, here we go again.
Well, to some degree, it must be this fabric that has just a little bit of a tight weave because I'm still hearing a bit of the snapping. But it's better, and a new needle was due. So are you guys sewing while you watch? Or do you just like watching grass grow? And if you are sewing something fun, let me know what you're working on. Not sure why at all, but it does happen from time to time. And of course it bounced and came undone. Then Albert was long on a percussion backing rack. Oh fun. Dave's reading these off to me, Sam is custom quilting a Stack and whack. Yes. Well, see, good. You can see me through your tears. I don't know. Dave's got the overhead camera on, so you can't see that. So I don't know what went wrong, but there is a bobble of thread on the bottom. I have learned, <laughs> well, I pulled it out already. Oh, okay. There's not much to see. But I have learned, where's my little cup with my seam ripper, Dave? Hmm. Uh, it's on the floor there, I think. I think you put it on the floor. Really yep. Little. Yep. I usually, by the way, in the interest of having tools handy, I usually, right on the top of my machine, have this a solo cup stuck. There's a peg there handy for it. Seam Ripper lives in there. It's a place to throw threads. But for the sake of the camera this morning, I took it off. Working on UFOs. Working on UFOs, someone is. Good deal. Sheila Willis is cutting on a Dear Jane block. Sheila's cutting a Dear Jane quilt. Wow, I'm impressed. We have another one asking the size of the squares. The, the size of the squares is two and a half finished. <laughs> nice job, Margie. I was starting to say, though, that usually when, either when the thread breaks or when I see a bobble in a stitch, like it's a bit loose, I have learned, don't keep sewing. Stop. Something has gone wrong. You've had a loop in your bobbin or something. And sure enough, that happened this time. Now, the thread did break, so I was forced to stop. 
but underneath there was a bit of a bird's nest going on. Oh dear. Linda is unpicking yesterday's because she grabbed the wrong bobbin. Oh, that's harsh. Well, I'd rather have my job than Connie's. She's apparently ripping up a bathroom floor, which I assume is either tile or lino. Thread keeps jumping out of my one um, um, thread guide. So I'm going to, it's not broken, but it is shredding a little bit. So I'm going to stop and re-thread my needle. And I think I may loosen my, well, I'll try a little bit more. I was going to say I may loosen my needle and try and adjust it a bit again because once again when it's not going smoothly it often is a signal something is not quite right we'll give it one more try because you do get one off thread breakages from time to time One of the great things about this orange peel design is it does firmly stitch down all those rather bulky seam intersections. And it will make a very nice flat quilt. You can probably see as I'm stitching, my center points of these squares are not perfect. Some of the arcs are larger or smaller. Um, but my philosophy on freehand quilting is, I don't want it to look like a computer. It is freehand. It's a human guiding this machine. So I try to stitch carefully, but I don't try to get too, too worried about the imperfections and you know you be the judge and I'll be the judge of my quilt when I take it off the rails am I satisfied with the overall look and texture if so it's a win threads while we're here. Once again, I caught my little 
My little side clamp. I guess I need to invest in another yardstick. The yardstick that I used, by the way, I'm a bit nostalgic. But it was my grandfather's. I'm pretty confident that it's older than I am. Which is not all that young anymore. Just saying. And look at that, it's still useful. So if any of you do give this design a whirl, post pictures if you will. Facebook or Instagram are my usual haunts. And just tag me, Stitched by Susan. I would love to see your work. Time to juggle the shoulders a bit. Sip a coffee. Sure, let's have some comments. Sandy, I think I will make a project Linus quilt of three inch squares just so I can try this technique. Thank you. Yeah, do it by all means. And you know, a small quilt, as this one is, it's a smallish lap sized quilt, is an excellent size to try a new design on. Not, not too threatening and not too big a commitment. I use Regina's side grips, easy to use, leadergrips.com. I might have to have a look at those. Apparently my husband has already Googled them because he's telling me, you might like those. Like, okay. I doubt that you guys, you can't see on the screen, but when I look at the quilting that is finished, I mean, you get the obvious orange peels, but I also get this secondary, I mean, it almost reads as a grid, particularly on the white. I can see this sort of diagonal line of these little melon shapes. I'm quite, quite happy with this. I hope Laura is too. Okay, another comment? Oh, that. Michelle, and here I thought I had the same issues when quilting because I'm a newbie. A in terms of thread breakage, yeah, no, it, it happens. It just happens. I actually had, I was saying earlier, I've only had this machine, I think I got it in October, and it is a used machine, and I got it through a dealership, so it was all serviced and everything like that. But I was having severe trouble with thread breakage. I remember one night I was doing a table runner. So one pass and I clocked nine breakages throughout. That can be pretty frustrating, let me tell you. So I actually did call the dealer and he came and adjusted not the timing, but the actual needle bar. Because it was basically the same thing as the timing. The, the movement of the needle bar past the bobbin to form the stitch, right? Was just a hair off. So I was very thankful that he was able to come and fix that because I knew that was a little over the top. But you do still get thread breakages, no matter how many quilts you've done. Our machines, after all, are fairly delicate engineering, you know. And a little thing being off just a little bit can cause problems. I'm not 
sure why my thread keeps hopping out of that one guide. Always the same one. Dave, is it possible that there is a tight cord? Because I'm feeling just a little bit of resistance. A couple of my rows coming toward myself just don't want to come quite like they should. Okay. You guys probably already know this, but I'm just going to throw it out there anyway. Once again, the other day was underlined to me the importance of really thoroughly cleaning your rails and wheels. I was trying to base the side of a quilt and I literally could not hold the machine into a straight position. It just bobbled. And if I let go, it would like slide into a groove, if you know what I mean. So I went hunting and I didn't really find any specific thing, but it just became clear that there was tiny, tiny bits of thread and lint and things in there and just a thorough cleaning was called for so uh there's a comment that's funny apparently oh, yeah. dave's been chuckling let me see them so to sam albert sam i've learned many new swear words dealing with thread breaks ain't that the truth it can be incredibly frustrating and i like break into a sweat when i get more and more frustrated and i'm just like mm, i don't know what to do and yeah Michelle, one of my quilt label quilt labels reads, created and quilted with love just for you with a few of my words. <laughs> yes, oh, more. Margie, when I stitch right to left, oftentimes thread breaks after about 18 to 20 stitches. Is that normal? It's not ideal, but I hear that from lots of quilters. Um, one thing that I've had success with, because sometimes it happens to me too, is turning my needle just a few degrees. Like instead of having it at 530, I'll have it at 525 or at 535, if that makes sense, on the clock. And sometimes that will help. But I hear that from lots of quilters. I'm, the bottom of my next row is only about three quarters of an inch above my, as far as I can go, if you will. So I'm just going to roll my machine forward an inch, just to give me a little more leeway there. There's nothing worse than quilting a smooth curve and bumping up against your front rail and then having a square corner on your smooth curve. So just that little shift will allow me to do one more row. I think I'll be cleaning my rails again today. There is just ever so slightly, occasionally, there's this little tiny bit. It's not even as strong as resistance, but just not smoothness that I know should not be there. And that's the first thing I will look for is lint in my rails. 
I mean, it can be as tiny as a little thread fragment. And you will feel that. Okay, I have another question for you ladies since I'm going to be quilting all afternoon. I need either A, some really good music, a good playlist, or B, an audible book recommendation. So for music, I'm currently stuck in the 50s. Ella Fitzgerald, a little bit of Patsy Cline, Natalie Cole. So I would love a good recommendation. Or a good podcast. Anything that I can listen to. And we'll buzz back up the side. Right back where we started. You're Dave typing like crazy. I hope he's giving you good advice. Ah. Yeah, I've pretty much exhausted crime junkies. I'm looking at the tension on the back of the quilt, and I'm not super duper happy with it. So I'm going to take a minute and measure my bobbin on the TOA gauge. Maybe even put a fresh bobbin in. Usually I don't have to... Um, mess with the tension at all you know when my project begins well if it goes awry that usually says something about the threading not about the fabrics if that makes sense if you start out well so my bobbin is fine on the toe gauge because i've had the thread breakages and so forth i'm going to just thread the last few steps here once again on the top Sometimes you can't visibly see it out of any of the carriers, but it's just not quite lodged in there correctly. So I like to, to type out community when it was bad. It came out as community. <laughs> Thank you. 
great to talk to the ladies here. They look really tired and sporty, so it's awesome. So Dave tells me there's 35 or 40 watching live. I'm so pleased. I truly hope that this is helpful. You know, as I said, it's not particularly instructional. You may not learn anything new, but it can just be so helpful to see how someone else deals with stuff. And quilting for me is like this. I'm always making decisions on the fly. You know, is it worth stopping and getting a fresh bobbin? Is it worth changing my needle? All righty. So I can reach this whole pass, so I'm going to go ahead and base this whole bottom end in. And then I think I'll rewind it a little bit. Once again, just so I'm not quilting at arm's length. That is extra fatiguing, and there's no need to do that. But I do like to get the whole thing basted in place, and then it will not go crooked on me. And I've just kind of eyeballed, you know, the long straight edge of my quilt. You know, depending on the size of the quilt or the level of quilting that I'm doing in terms of, you know, is it high-end quilting or is it just a casual quilt, makes my decisions over how accurate I am on that. If I'm trying to get a perfectly square quilt, I'll have a tape measure loaded across the front of it, and I'll be measuring with every advance and all of that. But for this small project, I think that um, my gauging it by eye, it's going to read square. It may not be perfect on a ruler, but I think that's satisfactory for this project. And if I have a quilt that's got you know, bubbly border or excess fabric, I would have pinned all this in place. But Laura has stitched this one nice and flat. And I'm just going slowly and kind of manipulating the fabric a little bit where I need to. To keep it smooth and flat. I do have my channel lock on, so I know that I'm getting a straight stitched line. So the edge of her quilt will be nice and straight. And I could change to a basting stitch too. But I don't bother. I just do all this basting in the same in the same stitch length that I've been using. So that's all basted in place. So I'm just going to back up a couple of inches, save my shoulders. Any more suggestions coming in? Oh, lots of them for okay. Them we'll okay. Well, I've got one for you guys in case you haven't found it. It's a podcast I recently found, and I believe it's called Declutter and Organize. Might be Organize and Declutter, but I think it starts with Declutter. Anyway, it's a lady who talks about decluttering, uh, but particularly it is geared toward the crafter. I've only listened to two or three episodes, but I found she had some really really helpful tips. And being January, she was talking about, you know, working through some of your storage and evaluating UFOs and things like that. And so she had some really good tips on that. So there's my plug for the day. I can't, of course, remember her name. Can't help you there. I found it on Spotify. That's where I usually listen.
I'm just going to reach under and check my tension. I don't know if you've ever done this. I learned this from my maintenance guy. If you run your fingernail firmly against the stitching line on the bottom, you can feel right away if your bottom tension is too tight or your top too loose, you would feel that laddering. It will kind of tick on your fingernail. So that was his handy tip, which I appreciate. I don't have an under machine camera. So if I really have to look, I either have to crawl underneath or I use a flashlight and a mirror. And either way works fine, but for a quick tension check, the fingernail test is pretty effective. Just mentioned too while I'm thinking about it. This, um, a replay of this session will be available in my Facebook group going forward in case you know you have a friend that might want to watch it or if there's something you want to come back and check out again. And we will also load it onto my YouTube channel, which also is Stitched by Susan. And by tonight or tomorrow, it should be up there. So if one platform is easier than the other for you to watch or share the link if indeed you want to share it. That's the two places it'll be. So tentatively, for the sake of organization, 
I'm going to make the one day projects all be the pale pink color that today is. And if and when I do more custom projects, like I did the Lone Star a couple of weeks ago, they'll probably be color coded to match the project because it will be multiple days. If that makes sense. So that's my filing system, if you will. So hopefully you can find, you know, what you're looking for if you want to rewatch at a later date. The Lone Star quilt, by the way, is totally finished and it's going in the mail today. I am giving it to our nephew and his wife. They are a young family and he's in the Navy and has been for quite a few years. And they're forever, you know, moving every couple of years. And I just thought that would be a very heartwarming gift for them. So, and it's no secret. She knows it's coming. So if she happens to see this, it's all good. And maybe I should say just a couple sentences for those of you who didn't see that one. Um, two or three weeks ago, I think, I did a series of episodes and they kind of have a brown thumbnail because it was a custom quilting project. And I was quilting a lone star where I got the star, like only the eight points of the star at a garage sale. And it's uh, probably 50s judging by the fabric. And so I appliqued that star onto a solid kind of linen colored background and then custom quilted it. And not surprisingly, the star was partially hand pieced, partially machine stitch, uh, done by a novice sewer, I would say. So it was not, you know, there wasn't anything very square or very straight or very accurate about it, but still who doesn't love a lone star and the colors in it were beautiful. And when I saw it in a little crumpled up heap in a basket at the garage sale, I thought, you know, I can finish that and make it beautiful. Someone saw beauty in those fabrics once and I saw it again. I am going to scoot things forward a little bit. I might not even have to change my side clamps. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I probably do. Bear with me a second. One, two, three, four more rows. Oh sure. Let's let's answer some comments. Oh okay. Yeah, let's do that. I need a break for a minute, anyways. Roll the shoulders a little bit. 
Let me get my cuppa while you do that. Dave's hunting for your comments. Well, while he hunts, I'll keep going a minute. Oh, he found them. Okay, pause. Here we go. Cynthia, I love Crime Junkies podcast. The Curtis Flowers story from season two was excellent. Yep. I think I've listened to everything the Crime Junkies have done. Safe to say. Sheila, if you like Patsy Cline, Leanne Rhymes, and one of my favorites is Alison Krauss. Beautiful and distinctive voice. Yep, I am familiar with her, but I'll bring her up again in my list this week. Long Arm Linda, Faking Friends by Jane Fallon. Ooh, I haven't heard of that one. Okay, thanks for that recommendation. Reading The Wives by Terry Ann Fisher. It is creepy. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> what did Dave do for you? I posted her link and I asked everybody that could post. To oh, links. Give their links for their home page so we can share. Oh, I see. So oh, I see. Absolutely. I hers because I had it on the screen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And you were in... Grand Forks, is that right, Sam? Am I remembering correctly? You've been on here a couple times. One thing I sometimes struggle with is density, whether the design is more important, texture or density. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, that is so subjective, right? Subjective to your taste as a quilter, subjective to what your client, if you're quilting for a client, is asking for. Yeah. Okay, do you prefer a mail service, USPS, UPS, or FedEx? Oh, okay. Dave says he posted a little bit. I use a th third party shipping company called XPS Ship, and they use all those places. So I usually do, do whatever is most economical, but most frequently I use the USPS flat rate boxes because then I can tell my clients what it's going to cost, and I, I know it in advance. It's usually going to be a large box, you know, about $20. Um, but when I have someone with multiple quilts and a bigger box, sometimes other options will be better. Eileen, what color did you end up using to bind the Lone Star quilt? Um, I don't have it handy, so I can't show you. I went super neutral. I couldn't find anything among my turquoises or cinnamony colors that blended well and looked good with the backing. So I went with a very neutral, it almost had a chevron on it, so it's got a little bit of interest to it in a light tan. Amanda, I couldn't do this. Have to use rulers with orange peel, at least in my current long arm quilting experience. Kudos for you for knowing where your limitations lie. But from time to time, I suggest on a quilt that's not critical that you try it because this is fabulous for learning how to make round curves, which is an essential skill if you're going to do a lot of freehanding or, you know, an important one. I won't say essential because you can do other things. But is that it, Dave, for comments? For now, yeah. Quilt for a while? Another crime podcast that I have listened to some is called Canadian True Crime. Because I am a Canadian. You can probably hear it in my voice, eh? Anyway, um, my daughter kind of got me going on it. And she sent me to a particular episode to begin with. Because it happened right outside of our hometown in a little uh, almost suburb, you would say. So, I mean, I knew even the parking lot in which this murder, because it was about a murder in which the murder occurred. And furthermore, our daughter is a nurse and the young woman who committed the crime had been her patient just a few weeks before this occurred. Like, oh my goodness, that's a wee bit too close to home. Right? But anyway, that got me kind of started on that pod. It's a bit different format, not as good storytelling as Crime Junkies, but just I know some of the places in it because it's set in Canada, and so that was interesting to me. Another true crime one that I really like is um, Small Town Dicks. Don't get put off by the name. But it is uh, 
Yardley Smith hosts it, and she is the voice of, is it Marge, Dave? Yes, the mother. In, in uh, Bart Simpson's mother. So she has a very distinctive voice, but she's a great hostess on that show. And a couple of detectives are with her in it. And uh, they just, they tell some great cases, and it's always from the point of view of the detectives that are... Um, investigating the crime. So Dave is going to mute me for just a second. We're getting my mic some fresh batteries. Give us a moment here. Fresh batteries in place. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Kind of like your GPS. Recalculating. Adjust my clamp, it's really pulling. There we go.
Oh, small town dicks. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't you remember that, Dave? You'd think that would stick. I'm sure Dave will put a link up there for you. And it's a good one to launch into because they have, oh, I would say five or six seasons anyways of shows. So there's lots of them. side clamp on on this side and I just should do that before I get a wrinkle. How come you guys didn't remind me of that? After all, you're invested in this project, aren't you? to the last row. bobbin thread. Conveniently, it happened right at the edge of the quilt. How nice was that? I have a question for you. 
Okay, can you read it to me while I change my bobbin out? No, but I'm going to answer it already. No. I told her not to tell you that I answered you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Okay, here's the question. Sam, how many hours do you spend in the studio a week? Do you have set hours? Do you keep or make weekly goals? Okay, what's Dave's answer? <laughs> Spend 27 hours a day if she could, truly is her passion. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that about describes it. There, let's put it this way. There is seldom a day of the week that I don't do some quilting. How many hours a day do I spend in the studio? Probably eight to 10, at least five days a week. And, I, you know, I'm also trying to grow my business in other areas like teaching and blogging and things like that and so I spend a certain amount of time doing that too so eight to ten hours is not necessarily at my long arm um could be at my sewing machine things like that so yeah I, I didn't I didn't really get all the I don't know if I got all that question but that kind of answers it and I don't really keep set hours and that's the beauty of a home job I'll tell you like one thing I do is in the summer I love the sun so I will get up early in the morning and quilt at five, six, seven o'clock for four or five hours. And then I sit in the sun in the early afternoon and I do it every single day that I possibly can. So do you keep or make weekly goals? <sighs> I'm trying to learn how to do that. So I have to say, honestly, I'm not very good about that, but I do try and make overarching goals and prioritize my time toward those goals. Yes. Sandy, where do you purchase your thread for your long arm? Um, Isocord is made by a company called Amman. I think it's A-M-M-A-N-N, -N, USA. It's a German company. And I purchased directly from them. So I was able to get a wholesale account with them and get um, a pretty good deal on the thread. And I have to order minimum amounts, which is not vast. I think it's maybe nine spools at a time. Sound bad. Sam. Sam I do the same in the summer. I float in the river almost every day. And hey, why shouldn't we? That is the beauty of being your own boss and being able to make your own hours. I still put in my 40 plus hours a week. I just arrange it so that I can be in the sun. Good for you, Sam. Where was I? Right here. I mean, in many ways, this is the dream job. I get to do what I like and I can, you know, basically plan when I'm going to get it done. I do love everything about quilts though, not only the quilting part. So I make quilts, I write a certain amount of patterns. I think I've got one coming out in Quilt Maker in May. It takes so long for those things to go through the process that you almost forget about them. By the time they come out in the magazine, it's a happy surprise. But anyways. So I enjoy that. I enjoy, you know, when I can, meeting up with a friend and sewing, and I enjoy handwork. To some extent, I am working on my first English paper piecing quilt. That is new for me. My mother was a quilt maker and very traditional, so I don't even think she ever owned a rotary cutter. Um, so I learned to hand quilt while I was yet a youth. And so I enjoy hand work. That's only a couple years ago. No biggie. We have reached the corner and I'm going to take the clamps off so I do not inadvertently bump into them. And do my last little row up the side. I 
And I'm just going to back up. As I ha oh, I can do one more. Never mind me. I'm not going to back up. There we go. Lock those stitches in place. And it's finished. So I will move Lucy, my machine, to the side. Dave says move her to the right, so that's what I'm doing. Now, is it helpful if I take it off, Dave, or shall I just um, focus a camera on it? I think I'm going to What's easier? Okay. Because I don't know that it has shown up well when I have, you know, held up the quilt for you. So I will leave it taut on the long arm, and Dave's just going to grab the one camera. So you can get a good look at this and see what the what the texture looks like in the finished project. Okay, so I'm I'm in the camera. So yeah, I'd love to know what you guys thought of that. Is that sort of worth the time and monotony? I think it is. I don't mind doing repetitive quilting. Um, I really don't. I find that it's a, it's a skill builder. It really is. When you do the same thing over a few, a few hundred times, um, it is definitely effective at learning a new skill. Uh, get my finger out of it. There we go. There we go. Uh, I can't move it very much. My cord is about at its limit. So I'll give you a look at this end. And then I'll let you see. You can see those diagonal in the white. It really shows up, right? So you kind of see that diagonal effect. So that's it. The orange peel. And you can see clearly my little imperfections. They're everywhere. And it's okay. I'm okay with that. All right. We're done with that. Okay. So that is the orange peel. Thanks so much for joining me today. And I won't promise that I'll do this every week, but I'm trying to do it-ish that way so you can always find me on my page here at stitched by susan like i said we'll be loading this tonight or tomorrow onto youtube as well so i have a channel also called stitched by susan easy peasy on that channel if you subscribe and if you hit the little bell you will then get a notification whenever a new one is uploaded so if you're interested in watching more of these that's a good way to know when i'm doing them so until next time happy quilting